Today, since it's Father's Day, I want to talk about the wrath of God. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, we had our young people, uh, they went to junior high camp uh, two weeks ago. And uh, then this past week, our senior high group went to camp. And so I just want to give them a challenge if I can. And all of us, because it has to do with parents and everything like that. I've said before, too often, especially today, young people, when something they do that's wrong, they have the idea they can blame everybody or everything else for their sinful actions. They blame their parents usually first, then others, then their environment, then their victims, or they have some type of disorder. <laughs> In order... <laughs> in order to bypass their responsibility. And kids have to fight that all the time. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that Adam and Eve were sinless. They were in a perfect environment. It's called paradise. And then in that environment, they still failed God and they sinned. And the first thing they did was to begin to blame other people. They blamed God first. Then it's that dirty woman you gave me, God. Then it's that old dragon, the devil, you've got. Everybody else's fault except Adam's own sin. And after all is said and done, Galatians 6, 7 is still true. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Each person is responsible for their own actions and choices. Now, I've, I've shared this before, but I want to share it again because a lot of times parents, they... They're placed on guilt trips, and we have to, uh, I mean, we beat ourselves up and say, well, I should have done this, I should have done that, whatever it might be. But here's the truth. Generally speaking, no one's parents causes a child to turn out bad or to do a bad thing. You think about it. There's Adam and Eve. They're the only ones living. They had no parents, <laughs> so they couldn't blame their parents, could they? In perfect environment, and they still sin. Cain and Abel, same home, same parents, yet one turned out good, one turned out bad. There's uh, Isaac's home. It was a godly home, yet his kids, Jacob and Esau, they fought all the time, and they still do in the Middle East. Jacob's home, it was a godly home, yet he had Joseph, who, who really loved God, and then he had his... Jealous brothers, same home. Then you have Josiah's home. His dad was a wicked, evil king, so he had a wicked heritage inside his home, yet he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. I think of David. Most of his kids were unfaithful. And then he had that one son that was worse than the others. His name was Absalom. But in the midst of all of that and in the midst of sin and everything, he had a guy by the name of Solomon in the same household. And then there's Samuel. Samuel, godly man, godly dad, godly home. He was a prophet. He was in a ministry. He was loved by the people, respected, yet his sons did not follow God. So I say, why all the differences while coming from the same home and the same parents? And my answer is this here, regardless of our circumstances, of our parents, our environment, each person makes their own choice. And that choice leads to their actions. But remember, Romans 14.10 says this here, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And at that judgment seat of Christ, we have to answer for ourselves. Nobody else. We can't blame anybody else for the decisions we make. We have to answer for that ourselves. Now, there's a difference between causing somebody to do something than influencing somebody to do something. To cause somebody, that means you de help determine them to do that. It produces the result. It forces an action. Influence, it means there's something or someone indirectly that has altered you to make your choice. So there's a real difference. 
And no doubt, parents, because of the, their lifestyle, their character, the atmosphere, they, the tone they set within that household, Perhaps they have a relationship with Christ. Perhaps they don't have a relationship with Christ. But they set the tone of that house. And their actions do influence kids. And by the way, parents will have to answer to God for being a good or a bad influence. But parents are not the final reason their kids turn out good or bad. It's the kids themselves that's the determining factor because ultimately they're responsible for their own actions their own choices their own decisions and how they live and each kid is capable of doing either one and the reason is if they've been saved they put their faith in the gospel they have the spirit of God but also they have that carnal man inside they have the old man still there and it's a cross pool. And they have to make the decision. Is it going to be for God? Is it going to be for my flesh? And anybody is capable of making the wrong decisions there. Amen? I say to our young people this morning, understand the authority that's been placed over your life. That's so important. God has set it up that way. He set it up where it's Christ, of course, and then you have your parents, and then you'll have your church, then you have your school with your teachers and your coaches and things like that, then there's the law, and then there's later on your boss. God has set over us authority to help keep us within a certain, a certain area so we don't wander out and do what's wrong. You know, as long as we're under that authority, we're under the umbrella of God's promises and provision for our life. But once we step outside of that umbrella of God's authority that he's placed over our life, when we do that, we're going to get wet. We're going to have bad consequences as a result. And rebelling and fighting against that authority, I promise you this, if you do that, your life will be in turmoil. Proverbs 16, 7 says this here. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And you please the Lord when you follow the authority God has placed over your life. Now, please learn this importance of being under the authority and respecting it. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not the law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall, shall they add to thee. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. In other words, it's time to be a blessing to your parents rather than being a pain to your parents. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 10.1 says this here. The Proverbs of Solomon says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. And we've seen it both ways, haven't we? As a young person, your decision, your choice... That determines if you will please God and you will have peace with your parents and be a blessing to them. But if your decision, your choice is not to follow, not to respect God's ways, your parents, any instructions, understand something. Don't forget this. God loves his children, but he hates disobedience and disrespect to authority. To reject your God-given authorities is to be rejecting to God himself. Proverbs 20, 20 says this, Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. It's quite a verse, isn't it? States in chapter 30, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out 
and the young eagle shall eat it. You remember Kill Bill, the movie? <laughs> she plucked out that eye. You oh, that's something else, okay. <laughs> Paul said this. I love that show. Paul said this, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So those threats from your mother says, I'm going to kill you, they might be true. <laughs> Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. That's a sign that Jesus is coming soon because we see a lot of it. A little boy was asked one day, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the little boy said, alive. <laughs> Amen. Here's some helpful hints. Be helpful and caring. Your parents are not your butler, your maid, your banker, your travel agent. Young people, just have you ever stopped to think about them first? Have you ever thought about them, what you could do for your parents. And by the way, you don't help when your room could win the city dump look-alike contest. <laughs> Amen. When's the last time you've done something nice for your parents? Let me throw you a curve here. 1 Timothy 5, 4 says this. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents for that is good and acceptable before you. You see that word requite right there? That means to pay them back. That means to reward them. I'm so happy my son's in this service this morning. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Even if your parents aren't the greatest, the bottom line is how you behave, you want to please God. And still, there shouldn't be the back talk, the rebelliousness, the selfishness, the, dis, the being disrespectful and unthankful. It tells, we we're told that to raise a child today costs at least $250,000 throughout their life. Yeah. That's not counting the extras. And a lot of parents have sacrificed a lot for you. Another thing you can do, listen to their counsel. By age 16, you think your parents are a brick short. <laughs> By age 18, 18, you think you've passed, superseded them in knowledge. By age 22, you believe your parents are out of it. They're stupid, losers. By age 30, <clears throat> you find out or realize that they were right about some things. That'll be hard to admit, but you'll figure that out. And then by age 40, you begin to think, wow, I didn't realize how kind, how smart, how loving, how giving they actually were. You come to an OMG moment. Oh, my God, my mother was right about everything. <laughs> Amen? I understand, they might or might not be up on the latest fads or fashions or the electronic gadgets, but they, by trial and error and experience, they learn some things that are not in books. Amen? And you need to know those things. They can say with David, once I was young, but now I'm old. You can't say that. An experience in life itself is an education. Then try your best to make an effort to be an honorable person. Always remember your actions, your lifestyle, either honors or shames your family, your God, your name. You see, it's not just about what affects you. Have you ever thought, I wonder what others think of me when my name is mentioned? Amen. Amen. That's so important. You have 
a name. And that name should, when people say it, should have helpful, reliable, trusting, responsible, godly, pure, strong in character attached to it. And by the way, that just doesn't happen by accident. It happens because somebody determined, they planned, they made the decision, God, my life, it's your way. And when you purpose in your heart like Daniel did, God will help you fulfill it. Now, I'm not being naive. There will be battles. Anything worthwhile, there are battles. There's a battle of the mind. That's a constant ass daily assault of anti-Christian values that you're faced with every day. We get it from the world, our culture, academia, the media, and most of what they think is values is contrary to the Word of God. And what you need to do is just get in the Word and stick by the Word regardless of what society says. We're not governed by what society says. We're governed by what the Word of God says. You'll have the battle of the mind. There's a battle of the body. There are things that want you, material things, that creates the lust of the flesh. They want your purity. They want you to experience sex and every, all these things. And it's calling out for you. It's a real battle because the flesh is everywhere. You can be home watching uh, the news and then Victoria's Secret will come on. Now, if you would have seen that 10, 15 years ago, parents would have had a heart attack. Isn't that true, mom, dad? Well, maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy what we are bombarded with. Then there's a battle of the family. Satan, you need to understand, Satan wants to destroy your home. He wants your, your home, your family to break up, to be miserable. He works at getting kids against parents. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers and rulers of darkness. And then there's a battle of the soul. The devil plays for keeps, by the way. Uh, he wants to keep a person lost for all eternity. And then if the devil can't take your soul, he enjoys messing up your life. And he's there and he's real. And then there's the battle of the eyes. We see so much wrong today. If you look at our government today for direction, you're crazy. <laughs> Amen? Psalm 101 verse 3 says this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. You have to make some kind of decision here. So, or Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, whatsoever things are, moving on to guys, <laughs> are lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Some way you have to turn your thinking away when you see it. You have to turn it off here and put something else in there to replace that so you won't dwell on that. Amen? And then there's a battle of friends. How many times have we said to you, you are who you run with? Amen? You are who you run with. Make Christ your best friend. He's the only one who really cares for you. Not only that, your friends should be there to help encourage you, not pull you down, but help you take the next step closer to the Lord. You need friends. The Bible says it's not good to be alone. The Bible says two are better than one. Moses had Aaron and Hur. Joshua had Caleb. David had Jonathan. Paul had Luke, Timothy, Silas. We need friends. Not only that, friends are very limited in number. If you want to be a friend with everybody, you're going to you're not have friends. <laughs> even Christ, even though he had the 12, he still had 
the individual three, Peter, James, and John, his closest people, didn't he? You don't have a lot of friends. If you can have a couple of three, that's great. And since you've been to camp and things like that, and you broke down some barriers with people, and you became uh, more friendly with them, you need to gravitate toward those people. Don't just do it for a week. Do it for your life. That's so important. Choosing the wrong friends can be disastrous. 1 Corinthians 15, says this here. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And that is so true. I've told you about Spurgeon. He was talking to this young girl. And she was wanting to marry this guy, her fiancé. And he was lost. She said, well, my aim is to get him saved. And he says, do me a favor, get up on this table. And she got up on the table. And he held her hand. He says, now pull me up. <laughs> she, t- she couldn't get him up. He said, okay, now let me try. And he pulled her down. And the gist to it, it's easier to be pulled down than it is to be pulled up. And your friends need to be those who pull you up. Amen? And then choosing the right friends means you mature better. Notice this verse, Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Amen? Who you run with will be who you become. That's why it's so important. 2 Timothy 2.22 tells us this here. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity. Now get this, peace. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You run from the fools and you try to gravitate to the wise. Psalm 119 verse 63, you know it well. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. You need to get close to somebody to become a friend who loves God, who wants to go forward with God. Not perfect, but they they have a desire, a heart, and they're trying their best to go forward for God. Those are the people you surround yourself with. Now you might think, well, would God use somebody as young as me? Well, 1 Timothy 4.12 says this here. Let no man despise thy youth, but... Be thou an example of believers in the word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He says, let no man despise thy you. I believe God calls young people. We always say this, well, the, you know, young people, that's our future. Well, there's, there's a certain element of truth in that, but not, not the future right now. Why not do something for God right now? Why do we have to wait until later on? Because usually you'll go to college and turn your back on God anyway. So if you get busy now, that might help anchor you so when you do go to college, you'll stay faithful to God. Because it'll already be a habit in your life. God called a young man when he needed a prophet in Israel and his name was Samuel. God called a young teen to suffer and be in position and place to save Israel. That was Joseph. God called a young teen to defeat a giant. Amen? And his name was David. God called a young lad and a, and, uh, to be a king when there was no one else righteous that was living at that time, and his name was Josiah. God called a young lady to stop the genocide of the Jews. Her name was Esther. God called four Hebrew teens to be the prophetic testimony and voices in a nation where they were in captivity, Daniel and the three Hebrews. God called a young baby while he was in his mother's womb. You can't get any younger than that. In the baby's womb, and that was Jeremiah and John the Baptist. God called a young teen virgin girl to birth the Savior of the world. Her name was Mary. And God called a young man to stand for truth and not allow other people to despise them just because they were young. And his name was Timothy. You say, well, I'm not much. To the world, Abraham was barren, but God saw in him nations. 
To the world, Jacob was a schemer. God saw him as Israel to have 12 sons that would become the 12 tribes that Messiah would come through. To the world, Moses was a murderer, but God saw him as deliverer and lawgiver. To the world, David was just a shepherd boy. God saw him defender of God's name and a king. To the world, Peter was a failure, but God saw him as the leader of the twelve. To the world, Saul of Tarsus, he was a Pharisee, a religious radical, fanatical, and a persecutor. But God saw him the apostle of Gentiles, given the gospel of grace, the mystery program for today. To the world, Jim Devaney was a loser, a low life, a great sinner. But God saw in me a pastor. I can't explain that, but God can take, amen, but God can take even the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Young people, you have your whole life to live for. Don't just make it about yourself. And I found out that when you come to the decision, God, I surrender my life to you. I'm available. God, use me. When you come to that, he'll take you on a journey. And on that journey, you'll find out some things that he still gives you the desires of your heart. Because when you're trying to live for God, your desires are better than when you're living in your flesh. Amen? So as you try to live for God, God will give you actually the desires of your heart. That's actually the way to be happy. <laughs> Is it not? On my own, I would have been a disaster. But with God, he changes things. He changes hearts. He changes lives. I love the one song uh, that Floor sang uh, about meeting the old people. And it's true. You meet some of your old friends. And take this from experience, young people. Uh, us older people, we meet some of our old friends. And we can see in them the emptiness. You can see it in their eyes. You can see what they're planning, what, what they're still chasing. They're still kids. Still just no stability. On and on it goes. And after you meet him, you bow your head. You say, oh God, if it were not for your grace, I would be just like him. Thank you for meeting me that day and saving my soul, changing my life. But then I also found out that even when you get in church, everybody's not trying to go God's way. I begin to say, wait a minute, everybody ought to be excited like I am. Wait a minute, everybody ought to, you know, God saved me out of such, you know, garbage and everything. Everybody ought to be loving God, wanting to go forward and do something for his honor and glory. And I'm looking and I'm saying, boy... And it bothered me at first until I began to grow and realize I don't answer for them. I answer for myself. Amen? I answer for myself. And that really helped me. In other words, I have decided to follow Jesus. Though no one go with me, even if your friends don't, if you stay faithful, God, I promise you, will give you great friends if you stay faithful. Boy, I, I see some of the friends that we have. I'm going to talk to the Lord about that, but I'm going <laughs> to. <but laughs> no, God's given us some great friends. I never would have had those friends if I hadn't decided Jesus first, Jim Devaney behind that. And I just say, I'm so grateful that you all went to camp. And I'm sure a number of, you, number of you made good decisions. Some people laugh at that, mock that. 
because, oh, they're at camp, they're on a high. Yeah, just a couple of days, they'll be back in the world. With some, that's true. But it doesn't ever have to be that way. I praise the decisions you made, and we want to support that and tell you to go for it. Give him your best and live for him. Amen? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our young people, the ones who went to camp and while they were down there, there were quiet times where they could actually think and then respond. And a lot of them said, Lord, you're first. God, I'm going your way. And we praise those decisions. Now, may they go further in those decisions. May they be determined, regardless of what friends or society and all this... May they just say, Jesus is first. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we pray that over these kids. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer.